Welcome to the Film Trooper Podcast, empowering filmmaking entrepreneurs. Hey, welcome to the Film Trooper Podcast. Yes, this is the podcast where we empower you, the filmmaking entrepreneur. And a great way to get started is to get the book, How to Make and Sell Your Film Online and Survive the Hollywood Implosion while doing it. It's available in paperback, Kindle ebook, as well as an audiobook. And in fact, you can get the audiobook for free when you go to survivetheimplosion.com. That's survivetheimplosion.com. Hey everyone, this is Scott McMahon, your fellow film trooper, and I want to jump into this episode pretty quick. This is one of the first episodes that Ron Newcomb had done on his own uh, on behalf of us. Uh, He's the indie film coach, Ron Newcomb, over at indiefilmcoach.com, and he's interviewed R.B. Botto, Richard R.B. Botto, and you might know him as the founder of Stage 32. If you're not part of that community, definitely go check it out and sign up and join uh, Stage 32. But he's also come out with a book, and it's really timely. It's called Crowdsourcing for Filmmakers, and it's not crowdfunding. It is really specific about crowdsourcing and how that is so powerful, and you can uh, learn more about the book and what he talks about in this particular episode. And it's all fitting because uh, this episode should be released uh, prior to the American film market coming in November in Santa Monica, California. It's the largest film market in uh, America, and it's something worth checking out. And this book might be very, very helpful. And you, if you go and get the book and read it, you know, RB is one of those guys who's very uh, approachable. And you can go find him and tell him how much you love the book and tell him how much, um, or ask him questions. I'm, and as you'll hear, he's very giving. He's very willing to share. And I'm a, a down-to-earth person who's accomplished a lot, uh, being the founder of Razor Magazine, as well as the founder and creator of Stage 32. But he's also, you know, been an actor. He's a uh, producer, a uh, director, and a screenwriter. So without further ado, I'll allow Ron Newcomb, the indie film coach, to interview our guest, R.B. Botto, here on the Film Trooper Podcast. Well, it all started for me, actually, with theater, believe it or not. Uh, back in New York, uh, I did a lot of theater acting um, when I first started in New York. And over time, uh, you know, I got to know a lot of people in the film realm out there. It, you know, a lot of that back then, it was a lot of TV, a lot of people doing a lot of experimental films and, and things of that nature. So I, that, that was my first sort of foray. Uh, in the film world, and then I, I left that for a little while and started a magazine called Razor. It was a men's lifestyle magazine. It was national, and that magazine uh, really got me kind of immersed in the film world because it had an entertainment bent to it, and I uh, got to meet a lot of producers and a lot of uh, you know in front a lot of uh, behind the camera talent, a lot of in front of the ta- camera talent, and also a lot of film financiers because I knew a lot of people that were producing movies at the time. So when that ended, um, I kind of got into the producing side. I really enjoyed the business of it all, and I still do. And uh, we had a movie that we put together, actually had quite a few films that we were putting together, and as is the nature in this business, quite a few of them flew close to the sun, as I like to say, and then fell apart. And uh, we had a couple of $30 million movies, a couple of $20 million movies. and, and. it's funny because it's just the, the nature of the business changed during that time and people weren't making those that that scale of budget type of film. And so a lot of those films, you know, the $30 million budget all of a sudden became a $6 million budget. Things were just rapidly changing. And, and the one film that ended up going was a film called Another Happy Day, uh, which we took to Sundance in 2011. And that was really the first feature that we, you know, that I was able to help get off the ground and uh, did well at Sundance. And, you know, since then, I've gotten more into the writing side and, and uh, have a script currently in development at uh, Covert Media and uh, doing more producing, doing a little bit of acting again and not really focusing that heavy on that side of it. But mainly on the producing and the, and the writing side and, and even a little bit on the filmmaking side as well, getting behind the camera a little bit. So nice. that's the uh, sort of cliff note version of it all. Yeah, no, definitely appreciate that. So over at Film Trooper, one of the lenses we're trying to look through is really the filmmaking entrepreneur. Those of us really trying sure. to do it as a vocation, as a business, and taking it serious. So when you're talking $20, $30 million, that is definitely swinging for the fences and love it yeah. and want to dive it a little bit. Uh, into that certainly and the other thing I really like about what you just said is 
hitting the business a little bit sideways. Like you didn't directly go at it. You had the magazine that you opened up relationships and that parlayed into um, a, a filmmaking career. So obviously uh, stage 32 has become a big part of your life. Um, for people that don't know about stage 32, how did that come about? Yeah, I, I, you know, and one thing I want to say too is I love the fact that you come from an angle of being an entrepreneur, you know, looking at it from the standpoint that as a creative, you're an entrepreneur, we can get into that a little bit more later, but I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, you know, you said at the top of the show, my name's RB. A lot of people may not know me. They may know it's, my name's Rich Botto. My friends call me RB. And, you know, I got to know a lot of people in the industry as RB and, and, uh, through the relationships, as you mentioned, and, and I, I, I'm specifying this by saying that I became RB through relationships. Hmm. Uh, you know, my friends back east used to call me that, and, you know, people knew me as that, my friends, but uh, people in the business now know me as that just simply because of the relationships that I made during the Razor years and now through the stage 32 years, and it, it is vitally important, and it is it was the catalyst of why I started stage 32. I realized while doing Razor that, this is a relationship business. You know, it sounds like a cliche, but it truly is not. It is just as much, I mean, you think about how many talented people there are out there, and this could be in the music business, this could be in the film business, this could be, you know, uh, painters, artists. Uh, so much of it comes down to relationships. There are equally talented people, sometimes significantly more talented people than you, um, who simply don't have the contacts. And so I learned early on that this is a relationship business. So once, uh, once Razor ended and I was kind of out there looking to take the relationships I had and parlay them into something bigger, I started using some social media to try to make that happen. And I yeah. also was recognizing the fact just by virtue of trying to put these films together, including those 20, 30 million dollar films, when we were trying to go all over the globe to get that financing or maybe possibly find co-productions in other countries or co-producers in other countries, um, we realized that you know, the world was getting a little bit smaller and that film was truly going global. So part of that was I wanted to have contacts all over the world. So I turned mm -hmm. to platforms like Facebook and LinkedIn and what I discovered is that, you know, nothing was happening. And there were, you know, Facebook was too broad. LinkedIn, uh, more white collar and, and filmmakers and film creators just weren't talking on there. I like to say that that's where conversations go to die on LinkedIn. And, uh, you know, so... I, I felt that the, the, the entrepreneur part of me, uh, or the entrepreneur in me, felt that the next move from away from broad-based social media sites were going to be niche social media sites. And then the creative in me was saying, you know, if I want to invest my time, and this falls into what you were saying at the top of the show about being an entrepreneur as a film creative, well, your time is valuable. And if, and if you're not treating it like a business, you're not really serious about it. So I wanted to make sure that networking – which I treat as a job and part of my job as a film creative, uh, that my networking time was being well spent. And so to make that happen, I wanted to create a network of like-minded film creatives. And I went to people in the industry who were friends of mine or colleagues. And, and you know, actually I built the first phase of it first. I didn't even ask them if, if they would want to be involved in it, but because I felt, you know, I didn't want to get the pushback. I wanted them to see it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I built the first phase out, went to a hundred of my uh, industry friends. And now today we're over a half million worldwide. So um, it's been a create, it's been an incredible journey. <clears throat> it's been a very rewarding journey. And what we're seeing that's really been sort of proof of concept of that idea way back in 2009. We didn't, you know, I didn't launch until 2011, had the idea back in 2009. But, you know, that idea that the world is getting smaller has certainly been, you know, uh, borne out. I mean, we've seen it now that, you know, content creation is happening worldwide. There is more content being uh, solicited and, and uh, desired worldwide, I guess, for lack of a better word. And, um, to make that happen for you, if you live somewhere else, of course, is to have contacts in those places or have, you know, contacts that have contacts in those places. And that's all relationship building. So that's where it all came from. And, and uh, you know, I, I've been happy to improve and write on that, I guess, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, and here we are. Yeah, no, Stage 32, it's going to sound like a, a commercial for a second because I've become like a super user but, you know, just like anybody else, I'm sure as you were going through the process of developing the site, 
um, when I saw it come up on my radar, you know, the question was, do I need another social media thing? And I'm sure you get this, and that's part of the probably the the entry in of that question. And dang, if I didn't, I mean, I've like really, really, you guys have done an amazing job over there. And I'll tell you in particularly what I just am geeking out about. It is definitely the the networking and the fact that it's niche. You're already starting from that affinity. So the conversation feels like it's down the road a little bit. I don't need to start like from a baseline to qualify somebody. I'm simply qualifying them of what are they looking for? What's their skill level? How can we help each other? This type of thing. But then your guys' training, you guys have over a thousand hours of education up there and keep bringing online these, these phenomenal uh, vignettes of like an hour, an hour and a half. I probably have done a dozen of them myself. They are fantastic. They stay like in your library. You can go back to them. They, the people that put them on make themselves extremely accessible. So uh, I'm just really loving what you guys are doing. And then on top of it, you guys have a little writer uh, section. So as a writer, I can go in and pitch a show, a movie. But then also, I just saw the other day, uh, now you guys have proofreading, which I just suck at grammar. So I would, you know, instead of paying these, these huge exorbitant prices to find an editor and get all them, they got to be the right kind of editor. Here you guys have identified a problem and streamlined that for me. And I know where I'm going to go when I'm ready to send it out right before I send out my script. I'm, I'm going to send it there because I know it needs to be kind of, kind of done. Um, who are you seeing as your primary user base? How is the site being utilized? Or if I'm jumping in and to our listeners, what can you advise is kind of the best use of the site? Uh, first of all, I mean, thank you so much for all of that because, you know, I, if I could address just a little bit of that, my, you know, one of the big misconceptions, you, well, one of the things you said that I, I definitely would like to, to comment on is, um, you know, that people will say, why do I need another social network? And I do get that all the time. And, yeah. you know, what I tell people is, you know, spend an hour in there and I think you'll see because there's no spam, there's no trolls, it's very positive. And I think, again, being part of a creative is support. And, you know, we, we all need support. I don't care how experienced you are. And I think the support of this community, the people in this community are so amazing and so incredible and, and offer such, uh, you know, they offer constructive criticism, they offer support. So I think that's a big part of it. But there's another side to this. I also get a lot of people who uh, I've known for years who I I'll see them at festivals that I'm speaking at or conferences, and they'll come to me and they'll be like, oh, you know, I didn't mean to spend so long with more time on that. But I, and, you know, when I hear that, I just, to me, it's like, again, are you serious about it or are you not serious about it? And that's not an advertisement for what we do. It's an advertisement in, in a way to say, you know, look, networking is part of your job. Education should be part of your job. Being active in the community should be part of your job. And if you're not doing that, then you're not really whole in what you're trying to accomplish. So I always, that's why when you join Stage 32, the first thing you get is a message from me saying, hey, I am just like you. A lot of people think that I'm just an entrepreneur that came up with this idea. I'm not. I'm a film creative that is scratching and clawing every single day, like every single creative that's on that site. And I don't care how successful you are, I always use this, you know, sort of analogy, but I mean, Scorsese had to wait 20 years to make silence, you know, he had to, he had to scratch and claw to find somebody to finally give him the money for that. You know, uh, Spielberg had to go to India to get the money for Lincoln. I mean, it, it doesn't matter what level of success you reach, you're always scratching and clawing and you should always be trying to make the next connection, the next connection, the next connection. And as far as the education, as you mentioned, learning and being on top of everything that's going on in this rapidly, rapidly changing industry. It changes constantly. <clears throat> I mean, day to day, week to week, things are changing distribution wise, who's buying content, the ships, how you attach talent, all of these things. So that's why education is so important to me and why we're so proud of uh, the teachers that we bring in. So that brings me full circle to, you know, what do we see? What we see is there are two types of people, I think, on stage 32. There are those who uh, come to net, well, maybe maybe three in a way. Uh, there are those that come, you know, strictly to network and kind of dip their toe in the water or, you know, they come and use, let's just, let's break it up to say the networking side and the education side. The networking side of things, of course, is more of the social media and the content. 
even though the content is educational as well. But I'm talking about the free content, our blogs, which we have over 1,200 of, and, and you know some of the other free content that we provide, some of the free webcasts and podcasts that we, that we provide. I think a lot of those, you know, a lot of those people come in and, and you know, they, I have to put this gently, they, they uh, some of them are hobbyists, mm -hmm. okay? Some mm -hmm. of them come in and you can tell immediately that they're <laughs> hobbyists. You can tell right away that they're, that they haven't done their homework, that they're, they're looking for something. They're looking for something out of, uh, out of the platform, out of the, out of people in a way that's selfish and not selfless. And I think those are the people that we see that drop off the quickest. And that's natural because it's easy to quit and it's easy to sit there and say, it's not for me. Okay. Then you have the people that come in and say, you know, the people that are uh, the true networkers and the people that come in and use the site every day, those people are more about how do I further myself? How do I make this, how do I make this my career if it's not already, or if it is my career, Am I doing everything I can to take a step further today or a few steps further today by making some contacts or learning something new? That's on the networking side. I said there's a couple of different types of people, but I'm going to break it up even more. Yeah. Those are the people on the networking side. We do have a lot of people that use the site strictly for education. They, yeah. They're not really on the networking side. They, you know, they come in and they take, all, take a lot of webinars and, you know, what I, what I tell them sometimes, I meet a lot of these people and mm -hmm. they, they'll they tell me like, God, I took so many classes and I took so many webinars and they're so great. I learned so much and everything. I just, you know, I can't seem to get traction. And my response will always be, can I pull out your phone, pull up your profile and I'll go and I'll look at their profile and I'll see that they have three people in the network where they've made three posts. And I'll say, you know, he, I got good on you for investing in yourself you know, to take these webinars, because you should, you should always invest in yourself as creative, save your money for the right things. I'm not saying just stage 32, it could be anything uh, that you feel is worthy. But the other part of that is you need to have the connections to put those things into action. I see this all the time on the screenwriting side, because people kind of identify with me, identify me as uh, with me as a screenwriter, or as a fellow okay. screenwriter. Mm -hmm. So they, they come to me and they'll say, you know, man, I got, you know, recommend on my script and I, you know, I, I got, you know, uh, uh, you know, I finished semifinals here or finalists there and I, you know, I just can't make things happen. And then again, I look at their networks and uh, network and I look at their posts and stuff and, and it's nil or it's next mm -hmm. to nothing. Mm -hmm. And again, it's like you could write the greatest script ever, but if you don't have the contacts to get it out there, if you don't have, you haven't built up the relationships to get the reads that are necessary, um, you know, it may, it, you're not doing the full job. Yeah. So those are the types of people that, you know, kind of we see. Now, the, the people that have the, the greatest success, of course, I think everybody's going to come to this conclusion before I even say it, are the people that do both. Yeah. The people that, you know, really use the platform to make those connections, to share content, to be, um, to be selfless, like I said, in a way where, you know, they are, active in the community at, in, in a way that um, uh, ingrains themselves in the, ingrains themselves in the community and you know they're doing stuff to further their education or they're taking advantage of the pitching opportunities or all the writing opportunities that you were talking about that we offer those are the people that I feel like have the greatest success those are the people that we see featured on you know the success story blogs or who are constantly mm -hmm. posting the success story success story section of the lounge state that says three times um, these are the people that, you know, have the greatest success. Now, again, you could say that's bullshit, RB. You know, you're just trying to tell me to spend money and to do this. And do I'm not. I, you know, when I say I gain nothing out of it, we, you know, people think that we make a fortune off of these things. It's like, you know, there's overhead, there's teachers and everything like that. If you don't post, I don't lose anything. If you don't make a connection, I don't lose anything. I, and I'm certainly not going to lose sleep about it. It's the fact that, you know, we bought this, we built this platform to help everybody, to help all film creators and content creators. And if you're not utilizing it and spending your time wisely, it's on you, it's not on us. And, you know, I always go back to the whole Michael Jordan thing, man. Michael Jordan, they used to say to him, you know, when he was at the height of his career and he won however many MVPs and championships in a row, he was out in a gym at like four in the morning shooting jumpers and a reporter happened to be there and he said to him, he goes, why, why, why are you, why are you here at four in the morning? And he said, if I'm not, 
somebody else is. And someday there's going to be somebody that's going to try to front me and I'm not going to let it happen. Well, yeah. if you're not out working the next person, and if you're not out networking the next person, you're not learning the next person, if you're not doing that, somebody else is going to take an opportunity that might well have rightly been yours if you put in the time. Yeah, no, I've, I've heard a similar saying that The Rock did the, said something very similar. Like The Rock is up at like, you know, 4 or 5 a.m. and working out. And, you know, people think, well, if I had the Hollywood money or all that, I, would, I, would look, I could look like that too. No, this dude is putting in the time. Right. And, and, you know, it's, you talked about uh, networking and it's almost like I was very, it was intriguing because LinkedIn, it was much more passive where stage 32, I probably have had a a dozen people reach out to me just introducing themselves. Uh, Stage 32 is a really cool thing. If you're new, you can just kind of introduce yourself and then people see that they read a little bit of who you are. And I've had composers reach out to me just introducing themselves and saying, hey, are you looking for anybody? What are you looking for? That's the first time. And rarely do I get asked, what am I looking for? You probably run into this too because I'm also, I came in through filmmaking by way of acting and I'm now a producer, director, writer, you know, type of thing. I never get asked to act anymore. You know, it's always what can, what can I do for them versus someone coming to me. It, it's rare. I've gotten a few opportunities but people have a tendency to put their own little lens on and not look at it from the other person's point of view. And, you know, you can't be passive in these things. The ones that are actually making it work for them, they're actively engaged in, in uh, stage 32. And I see the community doing that. So I've got like three or four conversations going on, you know, and, and really do want to take advantage of uh, uh, looking for, I mean, when I'm, Posting for jobs, for, for gigs, shorts and stuff even, I've posted on there and I've gotten some, some, some good feedback. So I can, I'm going to continue to, to use the site, but I wanted to shift into uh, an, another um, thing. And that is when I first got into filmmaking, it didn't take me long when I, when I had my first film to realize that the crowd mattered, that he oh. who owned the crowd ruled the day. And that with distribution changing and all these other platforms changing, there's people that are still trying to hold on to that so that because they know how to monetize it to a degree. But I have learned that the filmmaker, the uh, film trooper out there really needs to understand the crowd. And so you have recently come up with a book addressing just this very thing called crowdsourcing for filmmakers. And I believe the URL is crowdsourcing for filmmakers.com. And that is uh, soon to be launched. If you're, you're listening to this, it probably ha- is launched by now. And you'll be able to go out and, uh, and, and take advantage of everything that RB has been able to put down in there. But I wanted to, to bring out a few nuggets, if, if we can, with this. Um, well, why don't you just give a little bit of uh, background of, of what the book is about. And then again, how you kind of came to, you know what? what this space needs is help in crowdsourcing. I see stuff on crowdfunding, but I love your title, crowdsourcing. It's different than than crowdfunding. Um, People lose sight. They just focus on funding and forget the crowd. And without the crowd, we're nothing. So anyways, over to you. Yeah, totally. I I love it. Without the crowd, we're nothing. You're so right. Uh, The the origins of the book come from, uh, I was was moderating a panel – I get asked to moderate a panel by Jonathan Wolf, who is the, the uh, we call him the head honcho of, of the American film market, AFM, which is yeah. the biggest film market in America. And Jonathan's been at it for a long time, and, and he's always on the, uh, the, the cusp of new trends and how the market is changing and how film financing is changing. And, you know, one of the conversations we had, this was probably in 2014, I believe, we had a conversation about filmmakers taking matters into their own hands and how the independent film market is changing drastically because of the fact that the shift in the pre-sales market um, has been so dramatic. You know, it's, it's harder than ever to find those actors that unlock and, and the the directors that unlock uh, (laughs) pre-sales. So what we saw, and this was at the, you know, kind of the advent or, or the birth of, um, well, I don't want to say the advent of birth. I want to say that the shift towards short filmmaking mattering, you know, whereas mm-hmm. shorts used to just sort of be, not even, I want to say vanity project, but in some ways it was, but not very people really cared. Now they've become calling cards and proof of concept. 
And we were right at the time when Damien Chazelle had taken with Lash to Sundance as a short, one best short, and then came back the following year with the feature and one best feature. And of course, now everybody was saying, well, we should probably take matters into our own hands as filmmakers. Control your own content. That became the mantra. So Jonathan and I had a conversation about crowdsourcing and the fact that people really don't understand what that is. And you're a thousand percent right. And it happens to me every single day, probably three, four, five times a day when I tell people I'm doing a book on crowdsourcing, they say, oh, crowdfunding. Great. And I'm like, no, not crowdfunding, crowdsourcing. So there was a panel. We decided to do a panel at, at AFM in 2014. And again, it was really interesting. They gave me an iPad to take questions from the crowd, uh, from the audience as we were uh, doing this thing. And even though we had spent like 45 minutes before we got to the Q&A, Talking about crowdsourcing, um, when I looked down at the iPad, almost every single question was about crowdfunding. And so <laughs> even sitting there talking about it, people weren't getting it. And uh, it was very interesting to me. And when the panel ended, I got approached by um, one of the higher-ups at Focal Press. Uh, they're a publisher that does a lot of industry-type books. And they asked me right on the spot to write this book and it took me about a year to agree because I was busy with a lot of film projects and of course with stage 32 but I finally did and it was a really enjoyable ride because what it, it's the first book on film crowdsourcing and you know to be able to go out to people in the industry who have utilized the crowd in a way to either raise funds to crowd, uh, to source locations, to source characters, to source, um, uh, you know, cameras, and, mm -hmm. and you name it. You know, it's it's it was a fascinating experience to me because these are people that got it, and to me, they were sort of the new pioneers of this new age of DIY filmmaking. And you know, a lot of people think DIY; they think pick up a camera and just shoot, and that is a little bit of a part of it. But again. As you mentioned, and as and you're completely right, it's not just about the you know it's not just about going and make the film. You need an audience. You need mm -hmm. to bring a crowd with you. What do you do when you are done? So crowdsourcing for filmmakers is all about how to identify, engage, and move an audience for you and your brand, and the brand of your project, and the brand of your film. It's a very comprehensive book. We have three or four case studies in the book that are just awesome that you know speak to the, the origins of various projects how they got off the ground and how people uh how the filmmakers and the connections to those projects identified the crowd months and months and months before they ever even announced the film mm -hmm. or they announced it slightly but you know when it did, did all the strategy they needed to do to identify the, the people the groups the organizations that they would need to engage, to help move. Because again, what's more powerful, and this is proven obviously in this, the science of all this and the data of all this is in the book, but what's more powerful? Me telling you how great my film is or how great the project is or how valuable the project is or somebody else that you know, a trusted source coming to you and telling you that. That's the power of moving the crowd. Now, you <laughs> mentioned the, you know, the, the uh, confusion with crowdfunding. I just do want to identify and, and speak about this really quickly, but what people don't understand about crowdfunding and the reason why so many crowdfunding campaigns fail is, is that there is an element of crowdsourcing within every crowdfunding campaign. Mm -hmm. And the people that understand that are the people that get funded fully and quickly. Right. Those are the people that are planning three to six months ahead of time before they ever hit the launch button on their crowdfunding campaign. Those are the people that understand, by the way, because and this is the key, man, it's work. It's, it's work, right. and they put in that work, and they put in the time, and they find their crowd, and they engage their crowd, and they move their crowd, and they go make their movie. So that's a little bit of the origin of it and a little bit of, of you know, the, the content and, and how it came to be. Yeah, no, that's, that's phenomenal, and I've done several crowdfunding campaigns, and so just to give our audience some perspective as well, so I was fortunate enough to pitch to um, – to stars and one of the things they asked us immediately before I even got into the pitch was how many Twitter followers do you have and how many Facebook fans do you have and it Isn't is it amazing it is Isn't right amazing? because they, the world. yeah they knew that the mobilization of the fan base was really before the concept even could they want it kind of greenlit before they would 
and I needed to go and prove it to them that it would. Um, now, I might be able to do that if it's based on a book or something else, but if it's not, then I've got to go prep this audience. Uh, it was kind of an interesting thing. So you mentioned a few case studies without going deep diving into it, but just kind of at a high level. What Give us a little bit of idea of, um, of maybe one or two of the case studies and what you kind of found out there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are, well, before I can, if I can just say one thing about what Please. you said, it's, it's fascinating. What you just said about the fact that they asked you about your Twitter, your Twitter followers and your social media followers, I really don't want to skip over that because I want your audience and anyone who's listening to understand why this is so important, how this ties into the first part of our conversation about networking as well. Everything is about relationships. Everything is about the audience. Everything is about power and numbers right now. It is so vitally important and it is a job and it is work, but it is so worth it when you do it right. And you mentioned this pitching to stars. I've seen it recently where I've been at a casting on, on the casting side of the table. And I'll just give a, a, a brief, quick story, but there, it, there was a, we were casting for a, uh, uh, a film, a feature, and it came down to two, uh, one role came down to two actresses, and they were both spectacular. And they both had decent resumes, and you know they, they were both great personalities and people that seemed that they would be lovely to work with. And ultimately, the table was split, and one of the casting directors turned around, pulled out her phone, and looked at their followers, and guess what? Guess who got yep, the role? I okay. bet. This is the world we live in right now, for better or for worse. But to me, in a lot of ways, in, again, in that DIY world, it's for the better in a lot of ways if you're controlling your own content. Now, as far as these case studies are concerned, it really is a good segue because the case, there's four case studies in the book. Two of them are shorts. Uh, one is a feature doc, and one of them actually has to do with stage 32 and how we source the crowd for stage 32. That's sort of like a bonus chapter at the end, but it's very, very relevant in this idea of how you go about sourcing a crowd. The two shorts are decidedly different in how they went about their approach. All three of the, um, purposefully, all three of them involve crowdfunding and also traditional, like a combination of traditional funds and crowdfunding yeah. because I did want to show three examples of how they source the crowd to move them to, you know, have people donate money to the cause. But what each case study shows is the wide swath of the way that you could crowdsource. So for example, one film very, very much used the crowd uh, to source locations because they did not have a huge budget and the script required not only a lot of outdoor shots, but outdoor shots at government buildings and at very public places that, you know, things that needed to be shut down where they were able to source the crowd and go to government officials and offer them something and, you know, and, and again, work with them. And so very, very interesting stuff there. Sourcing of characters, okay, to try to expand your, uh, your group base. For example, one of the uh, shorts, uh, they decided to make, they sourced the crowd and said, you know, give us some characteristics of this, you know, this character. What do you think this character would be doing or would make it better? And somebody suggested the character should be a vegan. Well, that was interesting to them because that opened them up to the whole vegan community. And they were able to say, well, what would this character be doing? And I mean, so it was a whole new crowd, mm -hmm. within a whole new crowd within a sea of other crowds <laughs> that they were able to engage and move. And the, you know, the feature doc is one of my favorite stories. Um, it's a film called A Mile, A Mile and a Half. It, uh, it's about five or six film creatives uh, they're all cinematographers with the exception of one sound design uh, dude who uh, hiked the John Muir Trail and wanted to capture it in, in its entirety. They hiked it in its entirety and wanted to catch, uh, capture it in its beauty, uh, its natural beauty with, with high-end equipment and um, you know capture all the various ecosystems and everything like that. Now, on the surface, that doesn't sound like a very riveting documentary, okay, but what they were able to do was they were able to engage the, uh, the health enthusiasts, the hikers, the campers. They were able to uh, engage the gearheads, the filmmakers. And, and I'm not going to give away everything else, but a variety of other groups. And what ended up happening was not only were they able to raise close to $100,000 for a documentary 
really about six people hiking. Um, but they also were able to move that crowd in such a way that they were the number two documentary on iTunes for a while after Hero Dreams of Sushi, which I think has been number one since 1902. Right. And, uh, and they were the first film, documentary or otherwise, to uh, sell out the LA Film Festival to the point where they had to move it into a second theater. I mean, nice. it's, it's because they moved the crowd. Right. They engaged the crowd, they moved the crowd. And the way that they did it was so innovative, engaging, consistent, um, never let anything lapse. It's a great story. So those, those are some of the success stories, or some of the, I should say, some of the case studies. Yeah. I do call them success stories because they really are, but they, uh, some of the case studies that are within. No, nah, man, I mean, we got to have those, right? I got to know there's hope out there that someone's a little further down the road uh, doing this stuff and that, and that we can do it. So, no, oh. appreciate reading those. Because uh, one of the things that, that we do at my studio is we really try to cater to a niche audience of fantasy and sci-fi, predominantly fantasy, uh, okay. just for that reason. Because I know the audience, I can identify them, I can mobilize them. But talk to me a little bit about your advice or thoughts on how one creates a fan base prior to having the film. You had mentioned uh, a couple of things already that I really liked. You talked a minute about shorts and what that could mean. And yeah. then you also talked a little bit about the run-up time needed for the appropriateness of when you're getting ready to do a crowd funding campaign. Can you elaborate maybe on those two? Because... You know, it's, it is a little bit of chicken and the egg. It, it's as a, uh, an actor wanting to get into the union, you know, it was one of those, well, I got to be on a union project and all you know, the chicken and the egg. Or filmmakers can identify it as, I got to get the A-list talent to get the money, but I need the money to get the A-list talent. You know, it's kind of these dilemmas that we all struggle with, and it's the same thing. I need the fan base to get the, the distributor or the funder. How, any thoughts around these two, uh, two thoughts about how do you create a fan base beforehand and then the run-up time of leading up to a crowdfunding. Yeah, I, I do. Um, let me just say, if taking the crowdfunding part of it out of the equation just for a second, everything sure. begins with approach. It, it, you know, your approach is everything, and I harp on this in the book. So many people fail at social media, and so many people fail at networking and at crowdsourcing and building building a base for themselves or a brand for themselves because of approach. You know, so many people come in and they just say, "Look at me." They think that they sign up for any social media account and they're automatically handed a microphone. And what they don't realize is that if there are, in like the case of stage 32, a half a million people, there are half a million people with microphones. What do you do with that microphone? If everybody's shouting into that microphone at the same time going, look at me, look at me, look at me, you're never going to rise above the noise. But if you come from a standpoint of, what can I do for you? Yeah. Complimenting people again on, on uh, if, they're share, if they're putting up content. You know, this is one of the things that drives me nuts. If somebody posts a piece of content that really was good for you, yeah. or really, like I see this on the blog all the time on Stage 32. Like people will write me and say, oh my God, what a great blog. And I'll be like, it's a guest blog. Go, go into the comments section and compliment the person. Ask them questions. Why was it important to them? Why did they feel compelled to write that piece? Or just let them know what it meant to you. Or go share it. You know, yeah. hit that share button. You know, it's the same thing, of course, also. When you start presenting yourself that way, okay, you immediately start branding yourself. And this is the most important thing early on as someone who's selfless and collaborative. And if you're working as a film creative, I don't care if you're an actor or a gaffer or craft services, if you're not viewed as a collaborative, nobody's going to want to work with you or they're going to be hesitant to work with you. So that's one thing. The second thing is, is that you have to decide what is your brand? Okay, I got asked at a conference recently, I was speaking at Ollie Shorts on this subject, and an actress raised a hand and said, look, you know, I'm very outspoken politically, and who isn't today, I guess, and she said, you know, and I've been uh, called out about, you know, from casting directors and from producers and from some directors on my views on social media, and I said, okay. What do you hope to accomplish with your social media account? She's like, well, you know, I created it because I want jobs and I want to get work and I want people to see my reels and everything like that. I said, okay, if that's all you want, then you have no place for politics, okay? If that's not your brand, uh, if you want to be branded that way, that's what you're going to do. Now, that doesn't mean you can't speak your mind and everything like that. Create a separate account under, I, not only going to say a fake name, but call, you know, come up with a cute title or something and, 
you know, politically outspoken, two, 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 you know, and, and put your views out there if you want to. But if you're really looking to brand yourself, and people will look at that, okay? So that's another part of it. That's that good. brings me to your, your bigger question, which is the crowdfunding and building a brand and the chicken and egg thing. It's a great question. And, it's, and here's the thing that I think a lot of people get wrong, and sometimes this is an innocent thing. This isn't just a bad approach. If you're an unknown filmmaker or an unknown commodity, and, and I'm going to, well, we'll stick to the filmmaking side because this is about, you know, raising money for a film. If you're an unknown commodity and you go out and you say, I'm going to make this film and, you know, I think it's going to be fantastic and this is why and everything, you're an unproven commodity. Okay. There are a million other, that there are you know, a million other campaigns out there and some of them might have more engaging uh, teaser videos and everything like that. So what becomes important? What becomes important is the brand of your film. So for a first time filmmaker, knowing your audience and knowing how you want to brand your film and who you want, who you're going to identify, what people, groups, organizations you're going to identify, and then you're going to try to engage, and then you're going to try to move because of the content of your film, that really becomes paramount. Okay. Now, during that time, it's incumbent upon you to make sure you're delivering every single thing you that you promise to deliver. Mm -hmm. So that means that you're constantly putting content out there. That means, again, you're being selfless. That means that if somebody responds to you on social media or posts something on social media, that you are responding to them and you are thanking them every single freaking time. Because all of a sudden, people, again, are going to start branding you, maybe not as a talented filmmaker, but as a selfless creative and somebody that's engaging and somebody they want to know more about, somebody they want to communicate with more. Now, the film, if the film campaign is a success and you deliver on everything that you promise, okay, guess what happens? The shifting of the branding and the shifting of the feeling with your crowd shifts from the film to you because now you've been branded as somebody who is talented and who did deliver and who did bring home everything that they said or everything that you promised, okay? And now they're going to follow you into fire. It hmm. doesn't matter what the content of your next film is, yeah. okay? It, it just matters about you. And I, I'll, give you, I'll give you a perfect example of this, a very short story, is I have a filmmaker friend who did a short that did exactly this. He's a charismatic guy. He is a very, very good filmmaker, but he had no social proof of that. So what he did was he recognized that, and he put all his weight behind the idea of, this is, this is my vision for this film. This is the audience that I want to bring along with me. And, you know, he made it as broad as possible by sourcing different ideas for the film. And what happened was he had a very successful campaign. And he stayed engaged. You know, the campaign was over. It didn't matter. He posted every other few, you know, every few days, you know, pictures from the set, videos from the set, added bonus to the people who donated and all this stuff, and bonus material. And the next movie he did was a feature that the subject matter couldn't have been further away from the first hmm. film. And that thing got funded within three days wow. of the campaign because people loved him. And it yeah. became the brand to him now. And since then, he's done five more successful campaigns that get funded immediately, yeah. uh, or gotten funded immediately. It's all about, it, the chicken and egg thing really becomes about, you know, again, if you're a filmmaker specifically, if you're, if you're an actor or, you know, even a screenwriter, you're, you're branding, you know, you got to brand what is your brand? Who yeah, are you? Yeah. And the biggest mistake, and I think you, you started as an actor, so I think you, you'll you agree with this. The, the worst thing you can do as an actor when you start going on auditions is thinking that you're good for every single yeah, role. Yeah, for everyone, uh, right. For everyone, right? Yeah. Well, it's the same thing with crowdsourcing, right? Right. Don't And branding. Don't try to be all things to all people. Yep. Be everything to the crowd you're trying to engage and be everything and more to that crowd because that crowd has a million other things vying for that. The individuals in that crowd have a million other things vying for their attention. So just be consistent, be know your brand, know who you are, know what you're trying to accomplish. And I, again, paramount to all of that or at top of all of that is to be selfless all the time, you know, to be engaging and selfless all the time. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I totally agree with that a hundred percent. Love what you're saying there. In fact, um, so you had a guest blogger, a guy named Greg Green, and just recently did one on screenwriting, and I loved it so much I reached out to him, and I just had him okay. on the podcast. 
uh, uh, just a few days ago, and I'm actually interviewing Jonathan Wolf from uh, oh, AFM tonight. So yeah, so definitely trying to pull in as many uh, avenues as as we can here with it. Um, one of the things that obviously as as film troopers and we're looking ahead all the time, technology is always an X factor. With technology, how do you see the industry evolving? And then if you have any thoughts about VR, because I also consider myself a storyteller as the yeah. medium is broadened. How do you see VR potentially playing into things? I, you know, technology, it, it's interesting because I, I, I think that the thing that is more, I don't know, sort of uh, impactful, I guess, for lack of a better word again, I think, or the thing that's really kind of throwing the industry into chaos right now is the distribution models. Yeah. I think that that's the thing that really has everybody, because most of the people that I talk to that even are experimental filmmakers, they're, they're or, you know, or, or writing experimental things are, the world is opening a little bit for that. But at the same time, it's sort of like, you know, shit, it's this content gold rush and everything and this distribution. Yeah. Yeah, like there's a million ways to make money now. Let me let me focus over there. And that's one of the reasons why I think that VR, I'm still not convinced of VR as, I'm convinced of VR as a product and I think it has its space. I think it's going to be very, very um important when it comes to education, immersive experiences. I even think in for science, I think it's going to be huge in a lot yeah, of ways. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, storytelling so far, I think it's a little bit of a challenge. I I don't know where that's going to go. I, yeah. I don't see, I mean, I see a lot of people investing a hell of a lot of money in it. Right. I know actually a lot of venture capitalists who are, are I mean, man, you talk about divisive. I mean, I have friends that are on the VC side that are so into it and then I have other ones that won't touch it <laughs> at all. And, they, and, and both sides make compelling cases in a lot of right. ways. But I haven't heard the, the ultimate compelling case on the storytelling side. It, it's going to be interesting to see. Like I think it's going to be – I think it will be big for live events where you could like, you know, if there's a concert in Australia and you could sit in your living room and be yeah, in the front cool, row, right. I think, you know. Right. But – but storytelling, and I've seen quite a few shorts, mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. that I that are very creative, but they're more creative from a, wow, how they block that, how they do that, right. that kind of right. thing, than than really being drawn into the story. Although, you know, I I I know there's been a few things that I've played at, at some festivals recently that um, uh, people love. We did a huge event with AT and T on the Warner Brothers lot that was a lot about VR and AR. Hmm. I think that a lot of people in the storytelling community are more are more excited about AR right now than VR. Um, but uh, you know, yeah. it'll play it'll play itself out. Yeah, it'll no, it's it. it's it's hard to have a crystal ball on this side of things, isn't it? So um, obviously, you're in the education space. Um, you've been. It sounds like you've been, definitely have been in the game for for quite some time. And, any books that you would recommend for either filmmaking or entrepreneurship or both? And then a follow-up to that would be your thoughts on film school. Okay. Uh, on the entrepreneur side, uh, I love Zero to One. Peter Deal's book, I think, is great. Um, oh, man, what is the other one that I loved? Wow, I'm going to blank on this. Let me think if I could think of it. I, as far as, you know, I don't read a lot of craft books any, anymore. I don't find, I find them sometimes to be too limiting. That doesn't mean that there aren't some good ones out there. I, I like stories about the industry, mm -hmm. um, navigating the industry, because yeah. I think those are much more important. I think that yeah. you learn a lot by the, the pitfalls and the things that people have gone through. And even though they're, they're, they have a little bit of age on them, I think, both the William Goldwyn, uh, uh, Goldman's books, you know, Adventures in Screen Trade, more Adventures in Screen Trade, even though they, the stories are a little bit old, they're very relevant to now, and they, they always will be, because I think that navigate how you navigate things, how you accept notes, how you, you know, uh, operate with other producers, how you uh, handle yourself in rooms, how you pitch, I think those things never really change, and I think that... Uh, there are a lot of things that people get wrong in that regard, so I highly recommend those two books. Um, I'm trying to think if I've read anything else recently. Um, those are a few that I really like. There is one other, I can't believe I'm blanking on it. There's one that's other right. yeah. entrepreneur book but that, that I love, but I, and I'm blanking on it. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's fine. 
Um, no, those are some good ones, certainly. Definitely ringing off. I love the ones also, like you said, that navigate that Creativity Inc. You know, comes to mind. Uh, there, there's oh, several Creativity of them. Inc. Is, yeah. That's actually one of the ones. Creativity yeah. Inc. is phenomenal. Phenomenal. Can't yeah. recommend that enough. Yeah. Um, you know, the Rebels on the Back Lot. Yes, is another right. great one. Yeah. You know, because that's another one where you, even though, even though the indie world has changed dramatically, it's still another one of these books where you really get to see how, you know, Tarantino and, and Rodriguez and P.T. Anderson and all these guys, you know, they all came up about the same time and they all, they were all part of that late 90s indie movement and, and how they navigated the industry and what happened and, you know, some of the, some of the things that, you know, caused them maybe to be persona non grata for a little while and, those are those are very informative and, and very interesting. Creativity Inc. Though, man, I am glad yeah. you, you brought that up. That is an excellent book, and I yeah. almost required reading. It's phenomenal for yeah. entrepreneurs and for film creatives alike. By the way, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, it really is on both ends. One of the biggest takeaways as a filmmaker is was that brain trust idea. Love yeah. that that concept uh, with that, and and what Pixar is able to do. So, uh, you know, again, you've been doing this. You have some longevity. How does one have longevity in the industry? And then a second one is, because, you know, filmmaking entrepreneurship, you're such chasing the white rabbit at times, you know, and it's so elusive. And I find people that they have a sense of when I reach a certain level, I'll find con contentment. When I get here, I'll find contentment. Any thoughts on how does one find longevity in the industry? And then how does one find contentment throughout the process? It's, it's two great questions. I, I, you know, it's funny you say I have longevity in the business, but yet, you know, I've been, you know, look, I, I've been, if you take away the acting career in New York, I mean, just on the producing side and everything, probably been doing this for about a decade, a little, you know, just around there. And, you know, I'm not rich in credits and, you know, I have a few and, you know, but, and part of the reason for that is, but I've been involved probably in 30 projects. It's hmm. just that so many of them fall apart. And I, so I, I think the key to longevity in this, I mean, look, I said earlier, I have a project set up at Covert Media. This script has kind of, the path of this film has probably been three or four years and the financing has been around has been there for a year and a half and we've had a direct we've had you know a director attached and we've, we've moved on from that but while we had that director attached it came down to talent and, and things of that nature there are so many variables now so many people that say to me with the financing is there how the hell is this thing not going yeah, right seems legit on the surface but right. You don't realize there's there's so many other things that have to go exactly right, yeah. and then you have like I said earlier, the pre-sale market from when we started to now has gotten a little yeah. crazier and a little yeah. wackier, and everything is rearranging itself. So, long-winded way of saying that you have to have a ton of patience. You, have, I always say, I have a saying that you know when people ask me, I always know that people aren't serious. I mean, I get a million emails a week and a million, you know, stage 32 DMs a week. And I try to get to as many as I can, but it's amazing how many of them are. Can you give me some shortcuts? Yeah. There are no right. shortcuts. Okay. Right. There are no shortcuts. The only shortcut there is, is putting in the goddamn time. Yeah. You have to put in the time. Okay. And you have to be patient. I, I my saying that I started to say is that, uh, you know, it, sprinters need not apply. If you want to be in this business, sprinters need not play. You like need to that. be a marathon runner. Like and that. you need to have endurance. And you need to understand that the, the struggles that you go through from time to time, even when it looks like you're on the path to success with a project or with a role or with whatever it is, you're not the first that this has happened to when things go wrong. And, you know, you try to keep as much of an even keel as possible. Don't get too high when, th when you get some good news. Don't get too low when you get some bad news. But that doesn't mean that when you get the great news that you don't go and celebrate or when something is done that you don't, you know, relish in it because you should. Because it's going to be that, you, you know, when you're done with that project, in a lot of ways, you're starting from square one again. Okay. So that's the longevity question. What was the second one? It was how does, how does one really try to find contentment? Because I see people chasing the dream so much. I'm like, dad, bro, the, you know, your life's happening now, right? So you got to find contentment where you're at. And I'm just curious of how does one try to find contentment in this crazy business? 
Yeah, I don't think I don't think you should ever try to find contentment. I think that you know you look at a guy like Copley as the famous line that you know when, once you start doubting yourself as an artist, you're not an artist anymore, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but mm-hmm. it's, but it's the truth. You know, you should always have a little bit of an ease, and you should always have a because you know you, all the good stuff comes from that. That doesn't mean you should be a nervous wreck or you should never be <laughs> happy. And like I said, you should never celebrate the victories because you should. But I think that. Contentment means that you think you that, that you you believe you've figured it all out, and you should never feel like you figured it all out okay. because there's always okay. something to learn. Life is all about you know. To me, it's a learning experience every day. It's about seeking out those people who have achieved more than you have, and you know, tr- making friends with them, and you know, becoming close to them, and then asking you know, again, being selfless, but if when the time's right, asking for some advice or asking for some help or mentorship or whatever it is, but. Contentment to me as an entrepreneur and, a, and, a, and as a creative, which I view as one and the same, is getting up every day and loving what you're doing and getting up every day and, and feeling as passionate about it, if not more than you did the day before, and understanding that this business is ripe with challenges. Mm. Nobody works consistently. Nobody does. I don't care. Look at your favorite filmmakers. I mean... And if you know, and again, like I brought up the Spielberg and the Scorsese uh, examples earlier, even if they are working, they may not always be working on the thing that's first and you know closest to their heart. Let's say, and the, the you know the passion projects, it's a marathon, and you got to be in mm-hmm. it for the long haul, and you got to be willing to put in the work. And if you believe, if you embrace that philosophy, and you embrace that you're you're in it, if you really believe that you're in it for all the right reasons, and you embrace that. You'll be content, even when you hit your bumps. You yeah. know what I mean? They, I like they won't seem as severe, you know, as they might if you weren't. Yeah, prepared. I mean, so I have uh, a few um, A-listers, if you will, producers that uh, have mentored me a little bit along the way, just from time to time. And I was amazed at how much they're still in the hustle. They're still Absolutely. trying to get their project done. They're still trying to find the financing. They're still trying to figure it out, if you will, because it's constantly changing. And, you know, that was a little bit um, just reassuring to me, you know, that uh-huh. here's this guy. And it also made me up my game. It's like being at the gym, watching somebody putting some big old weight on the bench, you know, and you're like, okay, that's how they got there. It, that was just uh-huh. grit. You can't hope to have a, a, you know, a physique like that without putting in the blood, sweat, and tears in the gym. You got to put the time in, and that's just the way it is. Same with filmmaking, or really anything in life, right? I mean, this really is kind of a, a generic general life lesson but was a little bit surprised that even at these A-listers, uh, Scott, over, um, in I believe one of our previous episodes, 106, was talking to another filmmaker, and he talked about the tenacity to make it work really came down to one universal thing, and it was, real, it was grit. It was just the ability to just, through all the things, through all your self-doubt and all the failures, because not every project's going to be a success, is to have the grit and tenacity to just kind of kind of see it through. Um, well, as we yeah. start to, to start to wind down, yeah, yeah, please. Two questions because please. I think it fits into, I think it fits into, first of all, I totally agree. I, I was saying that, you know, get on the fucking grind, get on the grind, get on the grind, get on the grind. And if you accept that philosophy, you are going to challenge yourself and you are going to want to beat the next person and you are going to want to outwork the next person. And, and that's the way you win. I totally agree with that. But I'm very curious, you know, because it fits into everything that we were talking about the whole way and about approach and everything. You have these A-list producers that are mentoring you. What was your? How did that happen? What was your approach to make that happen? Because I'm sure you just didn't call them up or you know yeah. say, "Hey, mentor me." Yeah. How did you build that? I'm curious. How did you? And I'm sure it'd be great for the audience. How did you build that relationship to the point where you built up the the, the capital for them to say, "Yeah," or to even ask the question in the first place? Yeah, you know, it it was uh, one of them was we had the same post-production facility and they saw that I had a similar fan base as with this producer. And so they just simply said, Hey, would you like me to make an introduction? And of course I was like, absolutely. So the first was just from some questioning of, Hey, how do you think I should play this? It really esteeming him in their position and asking them not, can you introduce me to a distributor? That's not what I asked. I just asked a, how can I play this right? And they were very easy and open to get on the phone and help me navigate that. And from time to time when I have, you know, had a little bit of funding, I've been able to get them on the phone rather quickly just to answer some questions or to ensure that I'm doing it right. 
and that is developed into a relationship and to see it from their point of view and to offer them an opportunity. Like if I can develop this, would you be willing to, you know, come in and, and us do this together? And everybody's always looking for something else to, to kind of join in on. The second one was I'm a, a prior Marine. And so I was at a film festival that was, it's called the GI Film Festival. And one of their uh, board members is a producer. And so I was on a panel with him and he was prior army back in like the old school. And so I had some questions and he's like, absolutely, I'll get on the phone. So he just, he was one of those straight shooters too. You know, he was, <laughs> you know, doing that up, but it was through these uh, other connections and just asking for advice, esteeming them of where they're at and not really asking them to, to kind of fully close the deal for me. Like I'm willing to get out and, and do the work in the gym, but can you tell me how to work out here a little bit to make sure I'm doing it right? Versus asking them to do the heavy lift. Hey, can you go find me money? Can you go secure a deal? That's not what I asked. And so, yeah, that, that's how I did it. I, I think you're right. That, that was some good uh, stuff of, of trying to, to get them. Um, as, as we do start to wind down, because I want to be mindful of, of your time, RB. Uh, you I'm talked about, it. yeah, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> so you, you talked about your book. You obviously got stage 32. You got other stuff happening. But what are you working on next? And then what is, I'm assuming I know the answer, but what is the best way for people to support you and to find what you have going on? Um, yeah, I mean, there's so much going on right now. I Obviously, well, I'll take it at, you know, from a few different angles. With Stage 32, we there's just a, a ton of initiatives that we've been working on, a ton of partnerships. Um, you know, my... Uh, jokingly, in the first year of Stage 32, somebody asked me, "What do you What do you envision this becoming?" And I and I said, "Well, I would love for it to be the Home Depot uh, for you know film nice. creators and content creators." And now it's not so much a, a, of a joke in a weird way. It's just that the, we also recognize that we we personally can't be all things to all people. So we've we've forged some incredible partnerships. One of them is with Pure Space that. You know, for locations and film shoot locations, you could find that on the site. And there's a bunch of other ones that we're working on right now where, you know, we want to be sort of a one stop for yeah. uh, anyone working on film. So that's, that's some of the stuff that we're going to a bunch of other initiatives, too, that are in-house. Um, on the creative side, obviously, the, the film that we were talking about, a bunch of meetings coming up on that that hopefully will springboard this finally forward uh, in a way that we're happy about. I uh, just got done writing a pilot oh, that cool. I'm excited about. So that's getting passed around a little bit. And, um, you know, the book, uh, obviously extremely excited. Like you said, by the time this is on, it's supposed to be out the third week of September. So if you're listening to it after that, uh, please do uh, check it out. And I know you're interviewing Jonathan Wolf, and I'd be remiss because I love Jonathan, and we're going to be doing a bunch of stuff at AFF. Also, what's coming up? You're saying, what else is coming up? I'm going to be at a bunch of festivals. If you're going to, speaking at a bunch of festivals, you're going to be at ITV Fest, um, which is a television, independent television festival in Vermont. Yeah. I will be there. Um, I will be at AFM uh, doing some film finance stuff, which is going to be great, speaking on a, a couple panels there and uh, Fest Forms up in Santa Barbara, and then, of course, the Austin Film Festival. will be speaking down there. We do that cool. as a screenwriter-centric festival that I'll be down at. So if you're on any of those, please do come by and say hello. And then just how can you support um, – oh, I also should mention that the, the book is published under the American Film Market banner, which I'm quite proud of as nice. well. It's Focal Press, but it's the American Film Market Presents banner, which I'm very proud of. Awesome. Um, the – uh, you know, so the support, I always say, look, you know, we ask everybody to always spread the word of Stage 32 and to invite people to the community. And that's not so much, it sounds like a selfish thing, but it really isn't. In a lot of ways, it's selfless because the way we look at it is the more creatives that are on the community, the more opportunity, the more projects that are being created, the more, you know, it's more opportunity yeah, for the members, agreed. the more people that you guys can invite. And, you know, sourcing the crowd on your own in a lot of ways. And, and Stage 32 has been crowdsourced since day one. We do no advertising. It's all, you know, people who invite other people and word them out. So, you know, we're really pleased with that. Obviously, I'd love for you to check out the book, crowdsourcingforfilmmakers.com. And also, it's on Amazon. Um, would love for you guys to, you know, check it out. And, and, of course, let me know what you think about it. And, uh, you know, you can contact me, uh, obviously connect with me on stage 32, very yeah. easy to find me there. And if you want to connect with me on, 
you know, Twitter or Instagram, it's very simple. It's just RB walks into a bar, exactly how it sounds. RB <laughs> walks into a bar uh, on Twitter and Instagram, and I'm always around there. I try to respond to everybody uh, as much as humanly possible. So that's a little bit what's going on and a little bit of my ask. And by the way, just to, you know, kind of full circle on that, crowdsourcing, it all does come down to the ask, right? Because people are probably saying to themselves, okay, I'm engaging and I'm like, how do I move the crowd? Well, you know, like you said, with, with your great examples of the producers uh, that you that you met and that you nurtured the relationships with, you know, you, you didn't go right in, right? You, you forged those relationships and then you had an ask and your ask wasn't over the top. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, that's the entire thing. If you go in for an ask, the second you meet somebody, of course, it's going to be a huge turn. By the way, I have examples of this all in the book. I Some catastrophic failures that I've witnessed and horror stories that I've witnessed that I think people will find quite amusing um, and, and probably quite amusing for some of the people that I, I talk about in retrospect. But, um, you know, when you go right in to somebody and just say, you know, hey, I'm a filmmaker and can you do this for me? Or, hey, I'm an actor, can you do this? You know, it's it's a huge turnoff. You you wouldn't yeah. you know you think about if it was being done to you. But if you've nurtured that relationship and you say, hey, you know, do you think you could check this out for me? Or hey, think about what a difference that is. And that's the ask, right? Yeah. That's what it all comes down to is the ask. But how do you get to that ask, right? How do you get to a position to to be in a position to make that ask? And that's what the book is about. That's what nurturing relationships are is about. And that's what the most successful people I've seen in this industry, particularly those who are taking matters into their own hands and not relying on a manager or an agent. By the way, even when you have a manager and an agent, I have a manager. I do more work than I've ever done before (laughs) getting myself out there. Believe you me. Okay. Because it is incumbent upon you and because there are so many places to go now and there are so many people involved in it. And it's so, it's your biggest job, man. It really is outside of creating that content. So uh, how do you get on that path to co- to making that ask? And and I just wanted to really hop on that one last time. And yeah. hopefully, hopefully people are still listening and haven't shut me off by now. Yeah, no, man, <laughs> definitely great, great stuff. I'm I'm definitely motivated. I love. I think you guys at over at Stage Thirty Two really hit a nice stride at the right moment. It really came on the scene because the quality and the caliber of people that I've seen you all have been able to recruit. I think they're seeing the same thing. Like there, everybody loves a winner. And when the, when it's going well, it's like, wow, you know, every time you guys do more training, it, the resumes just get just wow. And I get more wow the more I, I see with all the training and the ability. Now, let me just also say that you're a man of your word. I didn't have some secret email, you know, that I emailed you. I contacted you on stage 32 and boom, you got back to me, you know? Yeah. So I mean, I, I you didn't use it. Look. I get hundreds of, of DMs a week. I try to get back to people as quickly as possible. Sometimes, you know, I'm traveling and speaking. It's a little bit difficult for me. I might take three weeks, two weeks, but I try the best I can. And uh, so, yeah, absolutely. And I so appreciate you reaching out to me. And then, you know, just to talk about the educators for a second, because I'd be remiss if I didn't. The the, the people that we have at State, you know, when we first started and we brought education to the platform, and again, I think this is, again, sourcing in a lot of ways like you know we went to a lot of the people that we knew that believed in what we were doing and we said you know look it's so important it's not enough to be connecting people we want to train them as well and it was amazing to me how many people said not only will I do this but you know I want to get back as much as possible and they did and over time what happened you talk about the caliber kind of just increasing and increasing and getting better and better and we've had, you know, Oscar winners and, and Emmy winners and Tony winners. And, you know, it's amazing. BAFTA winners. The reason we've been able to do that is the word of mouth from other teachers. Yeah. yeah they, right. they, they, the experience that they have. And they say, man, you know, you know who would be great for this? I want to go to so You need to have so-and-so. And it's, it's, that's just the sourcing. It's, you know, you're giving people the experience they want. You're showing, that, you're showing that you're genuine in your goals, which is to bring the best education at what we think is extraordinarily affordable prices. That's the other thing. We try to keep it oh, very yeah. cheap, no, it's you know great. what I mean, for the quality that we're bringing. And people see that. And that's allowed us to be able to bring in the caliber of people we did. And the people that we work with, I mean, you, you said you're motivated and inspired. I can't tell you how motivated and inspired I get when an Oscar winner ha- you know, brings their material and says, you know, I know I'm only supposed to speak for like an hour and a half, but I did like two hours. Is that okay? <laughs> Sit there and go. 
you got to be kidding yeah, me. Right, and then they right. do Q&A and they understand for three hours. I mean, it's just amazing. The generosity and the willingness to give back has been, uh, has humbled me, to be perfectly yeah. honest. No, I, I think you, you really have hit something. <clears throat> and it just keeps getting better and better. And it doesn't stop there. I've had people ask me, because I do some, some indie film coaching, you know, how can I get in front of people and pitch people? I'm like, at this point, it's an easy answer. Just go check out what Stage 32 has. They actually have the ability to, I mean, that is just mind blowing that you guys were able to do that. And you don't just have like one company that I've never heard of. You have a slew of people that you can go on there and actually get some real world pitching experience that someone could actually, if they liked it enough, could, could do something about that. And, yeah. I, you know, I'm just waiting for the headline of, you know, Stage 32 helped with this production. Uh, I know I sound like a, 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 an Uber, you know, a fanboy, no, and I am. I am. I'm really utilizing the what you guys have created over there because I, I fully buy into to not only that, but the crowdsourcing. That I have a saying, we're better together than we are apart. And, you know, they – People want to think that we're all in competition. We're not. We, we can be, uh, you know, an elite unit together, and we can do this thing together, not only filmmaking but life in general. It's not meant to be a solo sport. Um, but uh, we do share some, some friends too. Alex over at Indie Film Hustle, I got to listen in on his podcast of yours too. I love that you're putting yourself out there as well for all of us to, to benefit from, from the stuff that you're learning. And if I make it to one of these festivals, I hope I do. I'm going to make sure that I that I come up and uh, say hello. But so appreciate your time, RB. I'm going to go hit the gym real quick because I'm just need to get some of this energy out because you didn't got me all fired up. I can't go film right now, so I'm going to go work out. But so appreciate your time. If there's anything that that film trooper can do or I can do personally, please do reach out and let us know. Well, uh, I I just can't appreciate. I can't thank you enough, and I'm not. I couldn't be more appreciative of being here and you asking me to be here and. Uh, uh, you know, you mentioned Alex. He's great. We're working on a couple of things, and it just goes to show, right? Relationships, people who know each other. It's a small world. It's a smaller business. It gets smaller by the day. The world gets smaller by the day. Get out, network, make those connections, and and you know, reap the benefits. That's all I could say. So thank you, thank you for yeah, the opportunity. Absolutely, and we'll be looking for the uh, book, and I'll see everyone on here on stage thirty-two. All right, thanks so much, RB. Thank you, Ron. All right, take care. Film Trooper, empowering filmmaking entrepreneurs.